So I'm gonna talk about two research projects of mine. In 2008, I did a research project. I have a poster on it out in the lobby, and that's what my book is based off of. And it basically said, if you want to conserve chimpanzees, you have to start by helping humans. So my entire chimpanzee conservation research said, don't worry about the chimpanzees. Focus first on the humans. Now, the way you do this is by improving people's quality of life. So I looked at something called human capital, which I got from the Human Development Index. This is a measure of things such as life expectancy, income, job opportunities, medication, education, things that really kind of provide successful avenues for people. I looked at this, this score called HDI, which measures quality of life, and I looked at it in comparison to how many chimpanzees were living in nearby areas. What I found was a direct positive correlation with as HDI increased, so basically as quality of life got better for people, the chimpanzee populations were higher as well. So there is a direct connection between how well people are doing and how well animals are doing in the same communities. If you look at this graph, if you drew a line all the way through these points, it is a diagonal going from lower left to upper right. This means there is a strong, clear, positive correlation between these two items. So along the bottom, as life quality increases, then chimpanzee populations increase as well. Now you might see this guy over here that looks like he doesn't belong, and that was done on purpose. Kibali is Jane Goodall's research site. It is famous, it's very well funded, very well protected, and the chimpanzees do not come into contact with a lot of people. If Kibali had fallen into the same pattern, I would know that this is probably from chance. Because it was so far removed, I can say with confidence that there is a direct relationship between these two things. So to put this into context, if we go back to my friend Joseph, and we looked at his son Isaac, if Isaac had access to good education, if he could get medications, if he could get skills that would help him to have job opportunities, he would not have to hunt, and he would not have to cut down the trees like his dad does. This is because no longer would he have to only have a short-term, day-to-day survival strategy. He would be able to have a long-term strategy. He would be able to extend his life expectancy, to improve his health, and to work and save money. When that happens, people don't want to destroy their environments because they're thinking long-term and thinking of future generations. Now, looking at all of these different variables, I found that education was the most important one, the one that could make the most difference in quality of life. Um, this is the one that really makes people start switching from a short-term strategy to a long-term strategy. It can also help directly in conservation initiatives. Jane Goodall has a wonderful program where she goes to high bushmeat traffic areas and she provides chickens um, for people. And, teaches them the skills they need to become chicken farmers. This way they have sustainable protein, but they also have a way to make an income. But we live in America, okay? So we're not dealing with chimpanzees in the same way. But what I found in my second project is that education is just as important here. All right, so remind me, how many people knew of bushmeat hunting, which is good. That's way better than normally I find in my classes. Basically, this is not common knowledge for most people. We don't live right next to wild chimpanzee populations. We don't see bushmeat on the market when we go to the grocery store. So we're culturally removed from this, and I understand that. But because apes and other primates are so important to global climate and ecosystems, this is something we need to be very worried about. What I found year after year was that there was a huge gap in knowledge that most people, especially my students, had no idea about bushmeat and that there wasn't really an easy way for them to get a hold of this information. So I did a small study 
and I published this, and I did this because I wanted to get data that showed why I always complained every semester that we weren't covering primate conservation. Every semester I would have to add my own lectures, my own materials, homework assignments, and handouts, which I was fine to do, but I realized that most other instructors were probably not doing this. So there was no knowledge of bushmeat or other conservation initiatives um, in the students who are entering my classes. And I thought, well, even if instructors don't cover this, surely they could read about it in their textbooks. But most textbooks don't cover this at all. A few of them do cover it briefly, but it is not a focus. What is common for anthropology curriculum is primate taxonomy, like prosimians and anthropoids we talked about at the beginning, comparative anatomy and genetics, intelligence and social systems, and then it moves on. To me, I felt this was the same as a medical student learning about diseases, being able to identify diseases, but having no training in how to prevent or cure diseases. So I worked with the wonderful anthropology department here at COC, it was very supportive and very energetic, and we have put primate conservation as a main part of our curriculum. We did this by adding it to what's called our SLO, or Student Learning Outcomes. And these are ways that we measure what students are taking away from their classes. But I'm not just happy with that. I really want all anthropology, and especially textbooks, to have this as a focus. I also found that this can translate into a lot of other fields. We talked a lot about economic theory. We talk about biology and psychology and politics. There are tons of articles and books about chimpanzee politics or economic transactions between primates. So if this is something you're interested in, please bring this up in other classes. Tell your teachers that you would love to work on this as an assignment or bring it in as an example. If you are faculty and you would like any collaboration or materials, I'm more than happy to do that because I don't want people thinking this is only valid in anthropology because it translates to a lot of other fields. So quickly, I did um, a tiny little survey of 10 questions in 2010. I went to different high schools and colleges and I just had students answer questions. My main focus was to see how many of them knew about bushmeat. Out of 174 completed surveys, I found 11 students who knew about bushmeat. This was my main point. But then I also found out some other interesting um, aspects. I found that most students thought of chimpanzees because of television, film, or because of biomedical research, which is not surprising, but it is a little bit sad. What was interesting was a lot of them failed to think that apes would benefit from ecotourism. Now, I helped create an ecotourist project in Indonesia. Apes make great targets of this because they are um, usually fine with humans as long as humans know how to interact with them. You can see them visibly in the wild. They're not as dangerous as something, say, like a tiger or a lion. The last thing I found also was that everyone thought that apes were the most intelligent animals and they were the most human-like, but they did not say they would suffer if they were kept in captivity. So some of you may have noticed questions floating on the screen before the presentation began. Some of those are my actual research questions. So if you got a chance to see those, kind of remember how you answered and see if it matches how my students answered and also if you had answered differently after the lecture. Here we see that most people identify water buffalo as bushmeat, as something you would eat. This is because water buffalo is closest cultur culturally to what we eat here. We eat cattle and we eat bison. But actually chimpanzee, gorilla, and orangutan are much more common bushmeat items than water buffalo. Of course, chimpanzees are used in animal testing. That's not surprising. What was surprising was students didn't realize why. Until we talked about it, they didn't realize it was because they were so similar to humans. Then that brought up a lot of philosophical points. Here we see um, students not really thinking of primates when it came to ecotourism. And these last two slides are the ones that were really important to me. Now, I agree that all these animals would suffer if they were kept in cages. 
Going to the next slide, we see that the apes are the most intelligent in students' eyes. When I showed them this slide, and then I talked to them about captivity, I asked them, what type of enclosure do you picture for something like an elephant or a giraffe? And they said, the ones at the zoo that are really large, they might be kind of barren, but they can walk around a bit. I asked them what type they chose for an, an ape, like a chimpanzee, and they said concrete with bars. And when I showed them this slide, they understood if chimpanzees are the most human-like, they're the most intelligent, they're the ones that should have the large enclosures. Okay, we should make all of the enclosures large. But what I'm finding here is that even if students do have some knowledge, they're not connecting it with what's happening in the real world. And that's something that I still want to work on. So a quick recap before our last part. We have learned today what primates are, how to identify them, why they're so important. We learned what bushmeat is, why it's happening, why it's harmful to primates. And we looked at some of the causes of bushmeat, including lack of knowledge. So, it's not hopeless. I don't want to depress anybody here. I want people to become motivated. This is the harsh reality, the harsh truth, but I want everyone to know every one of you could make a difference. So we're gonna now talk about solutions. Number one is education. The more people that know about this, the more people can help. Ignorance is really one of the biggest hurdles we have. I've already kind of met my first goal by getting conservation directly in the curriculum here. I would like to extend this to other schools. I would love to incorporate this into any other fields. And College of the Canyons would really be paving the way for something that would make a global difference. But just because you may not be a student or faculty member here at COC, you're also very important as well. Remember, it's spreading awareness. Most of us probably use social media. Okay? You can tell people, tell your friends and family, but post things on Facebook or on Twitter. That reaches a large audience and that really helps to limit um, ignorance. Now you have a summary of this in your programs. So if you look through it, there's lots of resources, lots of tips on how you can help. But I want to give you guys just a few examples. And I'm more than happy to talk to any of you out in the lobby afterwards if you have questions. Number one, we can be informed consumers. Money really speaks in our country. It can influence decisions and influence trends. If you're going to buy wood, either in furniture or as a raw material, make sure it's sustainable. If it's coming from Indonesia, Asia, from Africa, it's probably directly contributing to bushmeat and deforestation. Also, buy American. It would be very good for our economy. Secondly, do not buy the smiling chimp or the smiling monkey anything. Please don't buy that greeting card. If you get a greeting card, politely say that that was a bad choice of greeting card. <laughs> Stickers. Posters, t-shirts, anything with it, just make sure you remember it's a negative thing. It's not happy. Also, if you see a commercial that's using a primate, make sure you don't buy that product. A lot of my students, and myself included, we've written to the company and said, I was um, a consumer of this, but now I'm not because you used a primate. And we've actually gotten good responses, and Dodge uh, responded very well to that. Um, don't watch any shows that, or movies that have primates in them. Try to not buy products tested on animals. Now, probably most of the stuff we buy is not tested on primates, but again, we really want to send a message to cosmetics and pharmaceutical companies that there are lots of other options um, besides testing on animals that work a lot better. Uh, don't see any circuses that come to town that use exotic animals they're probably utilizing negative reinforcement. What we do want to do is support any of the positive things we've, we've learned about today. So Disney's chimpanzee. It was about actual chimpanzees. It was beautifully shot. It was heartwarming. And a lot of the proceeds went directly to Jane Goodall's institution. We want to support places that are using computer graphics. 
instead of actual animals. So don't just remember to tell people or write about the negatives. You also want to support the positives. You can support locally. The Santa Ana Zoo, the LA Zoo are very close. We have the Gibbon Center um, here today, so please make sure you stop by and talk to um, their table. These are all really great areas where um, they're working on conservation and you can go and visit and directly contribute. You can make a big difference. There's something called the Great Eight Protection and Cost Savings Act that is going through legislation right now. It would end medical testing on great apes. Please write to your legislators and ask them to support this. Take an ecotourist vacation. If you're going to take a vacation, go to some beautiful exotic land, get to see wonderful nature and wild animals, and know that you're contributing. And you can always do your own research online and spread the word. So I really want to thank everybody for coming and listening. I really hope you learned something that you can use positively. Thank you very much. Have a good evening.